To commemorate London History Day, the London Fire Brigade Museum is celebrating London and London Fire Brigade's strength and resilience, highlighting how we came together during the Second World War and how this compares to our effort against coronavirus. This country is at war with Germany. As the world edged closer to war in the late 1930s, the Home Office instructed fire authorities to prepare for wartime fire risks. Extra recruitment for the fire service in London began in March 1938 for the Auxiliary Fire Service, or the AFS. Queues of people formed outside fire stations, all eager to join. The government intended to recruit 175,000 firefighters in Britain, but the Home Office estimated that they would need more like 350,000. By March 1939, only 65,000 people were available for full-time service. A huge recruitment drive was put in place. Department stores such as Harrods and John Lewis held recruitment events and speedboats were deployed on the River Thames with advertising banners. People joined in their thousands from all different professions, including lawyers, clerks, bricklayers and shopkeepers, breaking down long-standing social barriers. Among the earliest AFS recruits were women, who in the event of war were to take over control room and watch room duties. Women did not take part in firefighting, but undertook fire watching, worked the communications network, managed canteen vans and were dispatch riders. On the 1st of September 1939, about 89,000 men and 6,000 women were mobilised countrywide for the Auxiliary Fire Service. War was declared two days later, on the 3rd of September. For a year, the fire service waited to be called into action. During this period, known as the Phony War, the expected air raids did not occur, and firefighters were thought of by some as army dodgers. No longer were we the object of sarcasm. Criticism gave place to respect and admiration. In one night, we became an honoured service. The 7th of September 1940 marked the first targeted air raid on London. The Blitz had begun. The fire service wasted no time in bravely battling fierce firestorms, working in extreme conditions for long hours, almost to the point of collapse. For 90% of members of the AFS, it was their first experience of fighting a fire. During the first 22 nights of the Blitz, over 10,000 fires were started. During November alone, over 7,500 bombs fell on London. St Paul's was to be saved at all costs. Every farmer, without being told, knew the target was St Paul's, that St Paul's was to be destroyed that night. They almost lined their backs to St Paul's and pointed their jets outwards to make sure that no fire would reach St Paul's. One of the worst nights of the Blitz occurred on the 29th of December, 1940. According to German propaganda, over 100,000 incendiaries were dropped on the City of London that night. The small fires they created joined to form a firestorm. The AFS struggled to respond due to a critical lack of water, as 12 major pipes had been ruptured. Amidst the devastation, when the smoke cleared, St Paul's Cathedral had survived due to the bravery and determination of both firefighters and fire watchers. It became a symbol of hope and resilience. Due to this night and the subsequent raids that followed throughout the spring, the Home Office realised that a unified national service would be required to provide the equipment and personnel to deal with such intense bombing. On the 1st of August 1941, the National Fire Service was formed. The NFS was not just faced with incendiary bombs. In June 1944, V1 bombs, also known as doodlebugs, were first dropped and almost 2,500 hit London. These were soon followed by V2 rockets. They were almost 50 feet tall, an early version of a modern ballistic missile that carried over a tonne of explosives. Launched from France, they fell with no warning, often obliterating the entire streets in an instant. The rockets were almost impossible to stop during flight and throughout 1944 and 1945, over 500 fell across London, killing thousands. There was only one thing to do and that was carry on. So we carried on. 
The fire service had a shortage of uniforms, and so throughout all of this, many members worked in uniforms that were donated by the post office, who had a surplus. With long hours firefighting, firefighters would dry their uniforms on the warm bonnets of fire engines in preparation for the next air raid. In London, there were about 300 sub-fire stations used during the war, which were mainly schools, garages and small factories adapted for use by the fire service. When war was declared and the AFS was mobilised, many members were required to report to and stay at their assigned station. Not all substations were prepared for recruits, however, and conditions were very poor. Despite this, once the blitz began, many firefighters slept at the fire station even when they were off duty to ensure they were available to help if necessary. 17 hours later, we got a cup of tea and a hard biscuit. In January 1940, the government rationed food so that everyone received a fair amount. This is because ships bringing in food from other countries were often attacked and would not arrive. Things like eggs, meat and cheese were rationed. To help with rationing, firefighters often kept a few pigs and rabbits to add to their meat supplies. One fire station even had ducks and a turkey or two. Fruit and vegetables were not rationed, however they were often in short supply. Vegetables were grown in small gardens on most fire stations if there was enough space. The produce from these small farms and allotments added to the firefighters' diets throughout the war and for many years after. It was weird. Nothing but fire and smoke to be seen everywhere. Telegraph poles bursting into flames for no apparent reason. And now the bloody road starts heaving. In order to support the fire service during the war, additional fire engines were introduced. The most common was the trailer pump, for which the brigade requisitioned over 2,000 taxis to tow them. Trailer pumps could be used to relay water, often from the River Thames or an emergency water supply, to areas where it was needed. This was crucial, as many of the worst air raids firefighters had to control fires with limited amounts of water. This was because London was often bombed when the River Thames was at low tide, making it difficult to supply firefighters with enough water to tackle the blazes. Furthermore, the bombing caused 70 breaks in 6,000 miles of water pipes every day, and so it was necessary for vehicles to transport water. Steel frames were fitted to lorries, allowing them to carry up to 1,000 gallons of water to where it was needed. Before the war, London was famous for using heavy round thread couplings. Couplings join hoses together or connect them to water pipes and fire engines. The round thread couplings required a hose spanner to tighten them. In the late 1930s, every London AFS firefighter was issued with a hose spanner. However, with London couplings being incompatible with those used by other brigades, and because the round thread couplings could not be mass produced to the scale needed during the war, the standard home office instantaneous type was accepted so that London firefighters could use their equipment when helping other cities across the country. They were a grand lot and that work must never be forgotten. Firefighters were often involved in other activities to help the war effort. The Home Office had stated that painters should be given the opportunity to contribute to the artist's record of the war, where circumstances permitted. London Fire Brigade agreed that facilities would be provided to those who wanted to sketch and paint, subject to their officer's approval and providing it did not interfere with their normal duties. The Fireman Artists Committee was set up to promote the work of artists in the fire service. Between 1941 and 1944, the firefighter artists held four large exhibitions at the Royal Academy, which then toured the country. It is believed that the artist Rudolf Haybrook had the initial idea to tour America, with the paintings as part of Winston Churchill's campaign to encourage Americans to join the war against Germany. The exhibition, called The Great Fire of London, opened in the National Art Gallery in Washington in July 1941. Haybrook was singled out by the Americans as a good speaker and was soon on the road as a fire consultant, giving talks to hundreds of groups in a tour described as phenomenally successful. 
In December 1941, following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States officially joined the war. The talents of firefighters didn't end there. Many made doll's house furniture and model fire engines out of reclaimed wood from bombed houses and gave them to local children who had lost everything. Members of the fire service were also encouraged to take part in industrial production for the country's war needs. They carried out various tasks, including assembling, finishing, sorting and testing operations. When peace was declared on the 8th of May 1945, London's fire service had attended over 50,000 emergency calls and 327 firefighters had sacrificed their lives to protect the city. 75 years have passed since the end of the Second World War. Just like our wartime effort, when people volunteered to do different jobs to help with a collective cause, our firefighters and fire and rescue staff have once again shown the resilience of our capital city, our people and the communities we serve in dealing with coronavirus. Operation Seapole has seen us deliver over 9 million pieces of vital personal protective equipment to frontline health and social care workers. Firefighters have also delivered prescriptions from pharmacies straight to the door of people being advised to shield. In addition, food and care packages have been delivered. Firefighters from our specialist teams at Lambeth have collectively made over 37,000 protective face shields for hospital staff. Staff at Heston and Richmond fire stations have made thousands of personal protective equipment packs for the local NHS Trust and their community staff. We've also joined up with police and health services to form the Pandemic Multi-Agency Response Team. It was created to ensure a safe response to coronavirus deaths occurring in the community. In addition, around 300 firefighters have volunteered to drive ambulances to ensure London Ambulance Service teams are made available to respond to emergencies. By working together with communities, other emergency services, local authorities and critical agencies, we have been able to support London at this time of crisis and help save lives.